life wasn't easy for the first century Hebrew people. Life wasn't easy for the first century Christian people. As a matter of fact, it was a cruel world in which they lived, and it was filled with fears. Um, I, I love this song that we just sang, but I want to go to that slide. I don't know if you ever, I, I hope you pay attention to the words when we sing them, but if you ever look at the subtlety of the background, okay, and, and that's a, a, a bird, a dove, that's hugged away in the cleft of a rock with a nasty, nasty storm. Weak made strong. What great symbol that is of the weakness of the dove, but the strength of the Savior's love. And uh, every time we say that, I just look at that background and I'm amazed at it. It was a tough world, and it is a tough world. It hasn't gotten any easier um, to live. Now, parts of the world may be a little easier as far as outside persecution is placed on believers, but it's still the same world, and it's still a fallen world, and until Jesus comes again, it's going to be a fallen world, until we are resurrected into a new life, and the new heaven and the new earth come for us. Uh, we, we live in a, in a struggling and difficult and fallen and scary world. 93-year-old, Hazel um, Bedrosian walked out on the patio of her son's home in Malibu. One mile away, a fire blaze was sucking the, in the air and superheating it to over 2,000 degrees and exploding, exploding the flames upward into tornado force winds. The fire devoured everything in its path. High above the flames, Planes dropped fire retardant chemicals and helicopters dumped 3,000 pounds loads of seawater onto the blazing shoulders of the inferno. The ocean was less than a quarter of a mile away and had always protected these people uh, in the past from the fires as the ocean breezes always blew the fire away from them rather than toward them, but not on this day. Though they had not been told to evacuate, the rest of the family had already left with all the valuables that they could carry in the car. Assuming their 17-year-old son, Eddie, and 93-year-old grandma would be coming right behind them in the neighbor's car, but suddenly, everything changed. With a mighty, whooshing rumble, sounding like an approaching freight train, fire cut them off from hell. Eddie guided his grandmother into the backyard and down a 45-degree slope. As they descended, Hazel lost her balance and began to fall. Eddie chased after her and grabbing her in the nick of time, realized that the fire had now circled ahead of them. Grandma, we have to go back up. And knowing she couldn't do it on her own, he pulled her to the top of the slope. Looking, he saw fire in one direction was 200 yards away. In another was 100 yards and another was only 40 yards. This is it, he thought. We're gonna die. There was only one other way. It was a steep and thick ascent, thick as a jungle with brush and trees. And he picked up his frail grandmother in his arms, too weak to walk and carried her through the smoke so thick they could scarcely see the sheer drop off on either side of them. Trees exploded around them as their own resin boiled. Eddie's throat was dry. His lungs were burning, but he kept going. Hot embers dropped on his head and neck, and the fire was right at his heels. Suddenly, he broke out of the fire, and there was pavement. And there stood before him a fire. And looking at Eddie, the fireman said, where did you come from? And pointing back at the trail, now completely ablaze, the fireman said in disbelief, he just walked through hell and lived. You know, sometimes in life, we feel like we're walking through hell. Life can surround us with a fiery blaze on every side. Oh, it may not be a forest fire, but with troubles and fears on every side of us. 
You see, this is what Jesus did for us. He came to our rescue when all was lost. The Old Testament says some through the fire, some through the flood. Some through the water, but all through the blood. That's the way. That's the way of salvation for us. It's the way of rescue. And our Lord is one who rescues. He's one in our text who comes and helps. He's one who comes and saves. He came to our place of fear. And he carried us. He carried us. No, we didn't have to make the way and hope that he was near enough to help. No, we didn't make the way ourselves and hope that he was right behind us or even right in front of us. No, he carried us. And he carried us out, out of the fears of life and into real life and freedom. And he destroyed in the process the one who causes our fear. He destroyed the enemy. He destroyed the evil one. You know, fear is a powerful, powerful emotion. It controls our thoughts. Controls our actions, even it controls our beliefs. Fear enslaves us sometimes. By the way, fear keeps some people from flying in airplanes. It keeps some people like me from climbing up on ladders or standing on roofs or going to the Grand Canyon and looking down the edge. No, I can't do that. I just can't do that. It's a fear within me that says, this is not a good idea for, for me. A picture is just fine. Thank you very much. But the author of Hebrews tells us that in Christ, in Christ, we have victory over our fears. And that's what our text is about today. So if you would stand together with me, let's read our scripture passage. Hebrews, it's short. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. And it says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not an, uh, a, a, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Lord Jesus, as we spend some time in this passage of Scripture this morning, Lord, you, you know us, and you know the fears with which we struggle. And I understand the Hebrew people in the first century and the early church Christian people in the first century. And the fears that surrounded them, fears of death, Fears of judgment, fears of the enemy, fears of the power of the Roman Empire, fears on every side of them, fears for their children, for their family, for the future. Lord, we too, we too face fears in this present life of ours. But you are our source and our help and our cornerstone, and in you, the weak is made strong. Bless our time of pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. So there are four fears that are actually mentioned in this brief passage of Scripture as we look at it this morning. Four fears that were common to the Hebrew congregation. Four fears that were common to the New Testament first century believers in the world in which they live. And four fears which are very common in this day and age and in this world in which we live. Number one, the fear of death. Number two, the fear of the devil. Number three, the fear of judgment. Number four, the fear of falling. And I don't mean falling down. I mean falling away from the Lord. And so I want to look at those in our kind of a brief time this morning because we had a lot of activity. And it was what a wonderful morning of worship it was. What a great day. And thank you, Joe, so much for the praise team in our time of, of worship and singing. What a wonderful time to spend together as a family in baptism. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you that I've never, ever heard of anybody being healed of warts. Never. And, um, and yet, and yet, there's no other explanation for it. He had them, he prayed, they're gone. Okay? That's God. And that's the way God works. Is that awesome? But there are four basic fears that are listed here for us. And the number one fear is the fear of death. And people struggle with the fear of death. Christians sometimes struggle with the fear of death, but death for New Testament believers was a very real thing. Now, I know that I'm going to die one day, and I assume 
that I'm going to get old and die one day, okay? And, and that's the way life pretty much is in North America, in the Western world for us, and in much of the world today. But not in all of the world, not for believers in all of the world, and certainly not for believers in the first century church. Because they were plagued, they were plagued by a series of Nero's, or excuse me, of Caesar's, starting with Nero, and, and up through Domitian, that were evil and awful and wicked men that hated the church and brought great judgment on the people of God. And so these people faced death and the reality of death only because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the author of Hebrews writes to them and says, Jesus helps us in our fear. He tasted death for everyone, that he might free those who are held in slavery by their fear of death. Death, I think, is the most unwelcome experience in all of life. And you know, it is an experience of life, okay? It's the end of life. It's the, it's the period at the end of this present physical life. But among all the spiritual disciplines, I think sometimes we fail most at death preparation. I was thinking back over all the series that I've done in the last five years. And at one time we were in the book of Philippians, and the book of Philippians talks about death. At one time we were in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it talks about death. Here we are in the book of Hebrews, and it talks about death. When we were in the Gospel of John, it talks about death. In fact, every book of the Bible, I think, I, I haven't checked to make sure, but most of the books of the Bible speak to us on the reality of death, because death is a reality. Everyone, everyone will die unless, unless they are alive when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again and we are caught up in the rapture. I often have to laugh at Trish in our staff meetings because she always talks about she's hoping to be in the, in the rapture class in heaven <laughs> and wondering if the rapture class will run around with a t-shirt with an R on it, okay? <laughs> that, um, that we're brothers and sisters because we were caught up in the rapture. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's supposed to, I think that'd be pretty cool to have a, a rapture shirt for all of eternity, okay? But there will be a rapture class one day. Without the rapture class, eventually we're all gonna face death. And oftentimes we fail at death preparation, we're confused. Even in our own attempt to explain death. I mean, we understand that man dies and we understand the theology that death came into the world because Adam and Eve sinned. But what about what, what about tragedies that happen to believers and unbelievers? And why does God allow these things? We scratch our heads and we wonder why a loving God allows such a tragedy to occur. But then we read our Bibles and we see that in this present world, it's out of control. This world is out of control. It's broken because of sin. And we see it everywhere around us. An earthquake. Somewhere in the world kills believers, but it kills unbelievers. A terrorist wreaks the same effect on unrighteous and on righteous people. A church bus loaded with young people on their way to or from camp crashes, and there are many deaths and many injuries, and why would God allow that to happen to a church group of youth? A fire breaks out in a home and kills an entire family. And we say, yes, the world is out of control. Yet man tries his best, man tries his hardest to control these kinds of circumstances. It's always interesting. When I was a boy, um, we always ran around with a rabbit's foot hanging on our belt, okay? Like that was going to bring us some kind of good luck. How does that rabbit feel for Pete's sake, okay? No, a rabbit's foot doesn't bring you any kind of good luck. And then there's people that turn to their horoscopes and to fortune tellers of various different kinds. Sorry, it isn't going to help you. The Bible alone, the Bible alone gives us hope and tells us truth. Those in Christ will not die. Amen. This last week, our elder John and his wife Barbara Voss experienced the passing of Barbara's mother, a saint. A believer and at one moment she took her final breath and then was no longer on this present earth but guess what she had no consciousness of dying guess why because she didn't okay only the body is laid aside but the body is not our real person the body is still part of the fallen nature the real us is our spirit our soul it's the presence of the lord jesus within us there's real life there's real consciousness without the body 
And when we lay the body aside, there is no awareness of death. People that die don't know they died, okay? Um, they're not looking back at earth and saying, oh, I bet everybody feels bad. No, there's no consciousness and there's no sadness and there's no sorrow. Heaven, I want you to understand this. Heaven is life lived just as God intended and designed it to be at the very beginning, before there was sin and before there was a fall. Heaven is life as God wanted it to be for Adam and Eve. Heaven is life as God wanted to be for Adam and Eve and all of their offspring. A life without pain, without sorrow, without suffering, without death. That's what heaven is. Heaven is the restoration of God's creation. Heaven is the restoration of how he made you and me and all people that are in Christ Jesus. Remember last week's message? We talked about how Jesus is proud of you. Not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. Not ashamed to introduce you to his father. Now today's text goes on to prepare us for that day. And it says, in effect, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of that moment. Don't be afraid of that time. He said, free from your fear. You see, Jesus says us free from the fear. Because we can only pass in Christ. If you're a believer, we can only pass from life to life. Boy, you got to let that sink in. We only pass from life to life. We only pass from temporal life on this earth to eternal life forever and forever that never ends. We pass to the life that God intended us to know without sin. You see, Jesus became a man that he might deliver us and destroy death forever. And free those who are enslaved by their fear of death. The Bible teaches us three amazing things, truths about death for the believer. And I want you to understand, there's a huge difference between death for the believer and death for the unbeliever. I talked to the men in my Bible study on Thursday morning this last week. This isn't really a popular truth, and it's not even a popular truth in churches today and among pastors. But there's a huge difference between those that die in Christ and those that die outside of Christ. There is heaven, and there is hell, folks. And heaven is real, and it is eternal. And hell is real. And it is eternal. And those that die in Christ Jesus have absolute confidence that heaven awaits them. And the Bible teaches us three amazing truths. Number one, death is no more. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, and even though their bodies die, whoever they, they won't die. Whoever believes in me will live and never die. It concludes with Jesus looking at them and saying, Do you believe that? Well, I think they probably sat there and were nodding their heads. Whether they had, had completely soaked in yet or not, I don't know, okay? But let it soak in. In Christ we don't die. Jesus is a, the resurrection. Jesus conquered death. He was victor over death. He arose from the grave, and he gives life to all who believe in him. Number two, physical death is not a separator, but a uniter. I was thinking about that because we all know many people that have passed from this present world. I lost a father, I've lost a mother, I've lost a wife, and I've lost grandparents and many others. Close, close friends. I remember standing at the casket of a dear, dear friend in Alaska who had mentored me and encouraged me and discipled me for many years and was tragically killed in an airplane crash. And I remember just uncontrollably sobbing. Not for him. It was all about me. I was the one that had a loss, but in fact, death is not a separator. Death is a uniter. Paul wrote, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we lay aside the flesh and the blood and inherit the kingdom of God. And guess what? All of our beloved ones in Christ Jesus are going to be there. We're going to be united forever and ever for all eternity and never, ever be separated. Wow. Death is a uniter. Because we tend to think of it as a separator. I'll never see him again. Well, if that person's in Christ Jesus, oh, yes, you will. Amen. And enjoy them forever and ever. Number three, to be absent from the flesh is to be instantly at home with the Lord forever. No gap. No gap. To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. There are some churches and religious groups that teach some sort of soul sleep or waiting period um, or, or a, a conscious, less oblivion 
until a certain time happens. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that to be absent from the flesh is to be with Jesus. To be with Jesus. That's why I honestly believe that in Christ Jesus, when we come to the point of our last death, He reaches out His hand. He reaches out His hand and He leads us home. And as we looked at last week, and He leads us right up to the Father. And He says, Father, I am privileged, privileged to introduce my brother, my sister to you. They've loved you from earth. And now I wanted them to see you face to face. Instantly at home with the Lord. Be set free from your fear of death. And know that Christ, Christ is the giver of life. And in Christ, there is all <coughs> life. The second fear that they had was the fear of the devil. You know, I was thinking about this. Because it says, so that by death he might destroy the devil. I was thinking about that. And I think if you ask the average Christian, maybe, are you afraid of the devil? We might say no. I think if you ask me on the average day, they say, no, I'm not really afraid of the devil. I know my theology, and I know that um, they overcame him by the word of the testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and all the Bible verses that, that uh, rebuke the devil, and he'll flee from you, and, and um, all, all that. However, where the rubber meets the road is as my children were growing up. Oh, how I struggled with, will they walk with Jesus? Will they love Jesus? So what was I saying? Maybe the devil will get a hold of them. And so in reality, I was saying, yeah, I'm afraid of the devil. Yes, I'm afraid of what the devil does. But the Bible tells us that there is a truth that the devil has been defeated, and he's been defeated already. Pray for your <coughs> children. There is nothing you can do more than pray for your children and live Genuinely, the life of Christ in front of them. I'm going to tell you something right now. Those of you that have children, I pray for your children every day. I pray for your children every day. Yeah, yeah. I pray for Ryder. Yes, I do. Yeah. I pray for Trevor and Carson. Yes, I do. Yeah. I pray for. They're not here, but Oma and Nina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I pray for your kids. I have them on a prayer list, and I sit down and I pray for them. And I pray for my kids, and I pray for my grandchildren. And that's a long time to pray for all of them every day. And I pray for Joy's children and for her grandchildren. And you know what I pray? I pray that your kids will grow up to love Jesus. Amen. I pray that your children will be protected in purity and that a hedge will be formed around them by the Holy Spirit, a hedge of protection. I pray for your children. I pray for Ryder. I'm just picking on you guys, okay? I pray for him, that he will grow up to love Jesus and to marry a woman that loves Jesus and beget children that love Jesus. See, my, my, my mom taught me it's not too soon to pray those things. And I pray every day every day for this family and for our children and for the next generation. I pray for you too. <laughs> I pray for your children. And I believe, I believe in praying for our families. I even believe in praying for children yet unborn, folks. Because the devil goes to get them. Because they belong to Jesus. They're yours. And you belong to Jesus. As a matter of fact, our text tells us that Jesus, that he might destroy the devil. The Greek word destroy is the word that comes from two Greek words, kata and argos. Kata means, means to, to lower down. Argos means useless or inactivity. And so, so it means to reduce or to render useless. Now, take a look at this. Take a look at verse 14. Because there's something very important. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity that by his death... Now, wait a minute. By his death. When did Jesus' death happen? 2,000 years ago. By his death, he might destroy him who holds the power. That is the devil. 
So when was Satan rendered useless? At the death of Jesus. Not in the future, folks. Not in the future. Claim what Jesus did and claim it today because it's effective today. He, he won the battle at the cross. And when Jesus rose from the grave, the devil was rendered useless. So don't give him power and authority that he doesn't have. You see, we oftentimes attribute powers and attributes to the devil that aren't real. They're not true. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know your thoughts. He's not omnipresent. He is not everywhere at the same time. He's not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. Those attributes belong to God and God alone, and nowhere does the Bible give them to the devil. It doesn't say in our verse, the devil will be destroyed at the end of time. It says he is rendered useless by the death of Jesus. Hebrews is telling us that we can be set free from our fears of the devil. Why does he seem so powerful then? Because Christians listen to his lies. Because we listen to his lies. We give him entrance. We listen to him saying, wait, wait, did God really say that? That's his first line. It's his favorite one. All the way back in the garden to Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Yeah, God really said that. <laughs> Obey the word. Look what a nice guy the devil says. Look at all the good people who aren't Christians all around this world. Do you really think that all of those people that aren't Christians are going to go to hell? Do you really think that? I'm a nice guy too. No, he's not. He's a liar and he's a deceiver. God doesn't really love you. Otherwise, if he really did love you, he'd be a whole lot more kind and generous to you. No. We live in a present world. And yes, God is kind and generous. And God is faithful and God is merciful and God is a God of grace and God is giving us an eternal home. But we still live in a present fallen world. How about this one? Let me tell you the future. One of my frustrations is that I run into people that spend more time reading their horoscope than they spend reading their Bible. Amen. Don't read your horoscope. Read your Bible. You want to know what your future has? Read the Bible. The Bible is God's absolute truth. The Word of God. And then the big lie, the influence I can have on your kids. Look at the school system. Look at the music. Look at all the things around me. No. Stand up against him because he has been rendered useless by the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Be set free. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Number three is our fear of judgment to the Hebrew Christians in the early church, their fear of judgment. And it, it doesn't use the word judgment in our text, but it uses the word atonement. As a matter of fact, if you, if you look at the verse, it says um, in verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. What did a high priest in service to God do? Well, the high priest officiated in a judgment ceremony. It was called sacrifice. Sacrifice. In which, symbolically, the sins of the people were placed onto the sacrificial animal and put to death. Because God requires death as payment, as shedding of blood, as payment for sin. And so the work of a high priest was to officiate in a judgment ceremony. But all of the sacrificial animals of the Old Testament represented Jesus and the completed work of Jesus on the cross and the shed blood, the perfect shed blood, once for all. So judgment has already occurred for the believer. God requires payment for every single sin. But all your sins have already been judged. What about, this? What about if you sin tomorrow? Yeah, it's already been judged. What about next week? Yes, it's already been judged. What about next year? Yes, it's already been judged on Jesus on the cross. Your sins are paid for. Now, that doesn't mean you can go out and say, well, well I can live however I want to live because that's a lie of the devil. But understand, our judgment has already taken place for your sins. On the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. Get to let's stay high. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Get to let's stay high. Paid in full. God is satisfied. He's satisfied. 
with the judgment upon your sins in Christ Jesus. See, don't labor under false assumptions about judgment. Judgment is a very bad thing for the guilty outside of Christ, but not for the believer. There are two different judgments, the Bible tells us. There's a great white throne judgment. You read about it in Revelation chapter 20. Unbelievers, the devil, and the fallen angels are all going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. But then there's the Bema seat judgment, where the place of rewards talked about in Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5, and that's for believers. And it's a reward ceremony, not a condemnation. As a matter of fact, an author that I recently read said, it's, it's a thank you ceremony. God says thank you to those that by faith have come to him through Jesus. Isaiah 43, 25, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. You see, in heaven, in heaven we receive rewards. As a matter of fact, you're going to wear a crown in heaven. Now I don't understand what it exactly looks like. I don't understand all that the Bible says, and the Bible says much about wearing crowns in heaven. But here's what I do know. That as believers in Christ Jesus, when we stand before God, we stand before God on the Bema Seat, which is the Bema Seat was a place of rewards for the Olympic Games of ancient times. And the Bible tells us that there's a crown of life. That we'll be given a crown of life, of eternal life. Yeah, everyone that has eternal life through Jesus Christ will wear a crown of life in heaven. The Bible says there's a crown of righteousness. Guess what? Our sins have been imputed upon Jesus, and his righteousnesses have been imputed upon us. And what he is, we become. And what we are, he becomes. And he who knew no sin was made to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in heaven. So right there, you have two crowns. You have a crown of life. You have a crown of righteousness. I don't know. Is one going to sit on top of the other? I don't know. I don't know how that's going to be. When I was a kid, we, we got perfect attendance awards in Sunday school. And, and you got this perfect attendance that bar for the first year. And then if you had perfect attendance the second year, you, you have another little bar that hung from it. And then another one that hung from that, and then another one that hung from that. I had like five years of perfect attendance, okay? But when you went on vacation, you had to go to a church and get a note from somebody in the church that you were there. <laughs> but I wanted my perfect attendance. Maybe crowns are going to be that. Maybe it's going to stack. I don't know. <laughs> the soul winner's crown. You say, well, I've never led anybody to the Lord. Haven't you? What about your children? You might be surprised when you get to heaven that somebody's going to come along. Somebody that you don't even know might stand up and God's going to say, tell us how you became a believer. And that person says, one day I was at work at USAA and I saw this guy Joe Berkey. And he sat down for lunch and he bowed his head and prayed. So I'm a Christian today because of Joe Burke. And Joe looks at that and says, I don't even remember seeing you there. Yeah, yeah, you might be surprised at who's in heaven because of your faithfulness to the Lord. And then there's the golden crown of victory. Yeah, we're victors in Christ Jesus. And then there's crown of glory. So I think, one, two, three, four, there's five crowns right there. I think we're going to have them. <clears throat> Because God's going to say thank you. Thank you for believing in my son. So there's two great promises. Luke 6, 35, your reward will be great, folks. And you will be children of the Most High. In 1 John 4, 17, his love is fulfilled with us. So that on the day of judgment, we have confidence based on our identification with Jesus in this world. Be victorious over your fear of the judgment. Look forward to it. It's a good day for those who are in Christ Jesus. And last is the fear of falling. The fear of being tempted and giving in. Well, let me tell you this. That in life, we still are in the flesh. The body is still alive. And the temptations of the flesh are real. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the vain glory of life, they are real. And the apostle... John wrote, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then he went on. And he said, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 1. I write these things to you so that you will not sin. But, because he knows this, when you do sin, you have an advocate that speaks on your behalf before the Father. You see, even the most holy man of old, the Apostle John, the one who leaned back against the breast of Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved, knew that we were still subject to temptation and to sin in this present life. But in our temptation, Jesus is our helper. We find help in him. Being able to help those who are being tempted. Help. Again, it's two Greek words. Bothos. Bothos. Boa. One who runs, thos, to the cry. You see, Jesus is our helper. Cry out to him. And guess what he does? He comes running. He comes running. Moms. It's always amazing to me how moms can hear the voice of their children miles away. <laughs> there can be two dozen kids and one of them cries, and the right mom goes, Dads, <laughs> they don't hear the cry. <clears throat> Moms, boy, they know their own. They know their own. And a baby cries, and mom goes, not dads, too. I, I certainly responded many times to my children and their wounds. A cry and a response. A cry out to Jesus. Because he comes running. Tell in such a way, it says, and the word means, it means to help in such a way as to bring success. To come to the aid of. He rescues us. Jude 24. And now to him who can keep you on your feet, standing tall in his bright presence, fresh and celebrating. That's the message. Paraphrase. And now to him who can keep you on your feet, standing tall in his bright presence, fresh and celebrating. And the King James, now unto him who can is able to keep you from falling, it says. So what are your fears? Jesus is there. What's your greatest fear in life? Cry out to Jesus. Because into our greatest fears, Jesus comes to rescue us. Pick us up, to carry us through, to save us from the fires of hell, and to take us home to be with him forever. He rescues us from death and gives to us life everlasting. He rescues us from the devil having defeated him already, and one day the devil is going to be punished forever and ever. He rescues us from judgment having already been judged on our behalf, and he rescues us from fall. He's our helper. Cry out. Lay hold of the blessing that Jesus 